I'm very excited to be here. I guess you are too. Um, and uh, we will get started with our first talker for the day. Um, he is a security researcher at SBA Research, and he's also a member of CCC Vienna. Um, the talk we'll be hearing today is uh, everything you always wanted to know about certificate transparency. Um, and with that, I will pass on the stage. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Martin Schmiedeker. Thank you very much for this kind words and this very nice introduction. Um, as already said, I'm a member of CCC Vienna. I'm also on Twitter, so if you have a comment afterwards or want to ping me, uh, if you find a typo in the slides or whatever, just ping me on Twitter. So what is this talk about? What are we going to talk about? Certificate transparency is kind of a new thing in the TLS ecosystem, so not many people um, are familiar that it is here. Um, so I will present the overview, what, what is CT and what it does, uh, and also we'll peek under the hood and see what it actually does, how it works, uh, and how you can uh, play with it. Uh, so one of the things uh, I have to say about myself, I'm, I'm a keen fan of internet memes. Um, so even though these are hilarious pictures, I, personally I find hilarious pictures that I put online, um, keep in mind that HTTPS is a serious topic, so whether do you do net banking, you're Googling or uh, whatever you do online, HTTPS is there to protect your privacy and to protect your um, security. And in some states, and this, this has been shown by history, uh, this is not a case, so there are nationwide uh, introspecting devices which break open the TLS encryption and look at the content and uh, people will get a visit from secret police or anything and they will knock on their door and arrest them just like this week happened uh, in Turkey where people got arrested for posting things on Facebook. So even though there are uh, some funny pictures in there, uh, keep in mind that this is just a uh, just a um, means to an end for my uh, presentation. I personally f find HTTPS is a very important topic. Uh, I hope I con convinced you too, and uh, CT in particular is uh, fascinating. So why is there something like certificate transparency? Like the name says it all, um, you have, to, if you are a certification authority, you want to make public the certificates you uh, sell or you issue. Um, and with many good stories and with many good tools, it all started with a hack. Um, back in 2011, there was uh, this Dutch certification authority called DigiNotar, and they got pwned. They get really, really badly fisted. Um, they, they lost everything. They, they lost all their crown jewels. Uh, and as part of this hack, um, there were 500 something fraudulent uh, certificates issued. And not just any certificates, not just like uh, Let's Encrypt, where you can get a free certificate and then use it for your uh, internal systems or for your website or whatever. No, really, really high value domains and high value uh, certificates like Google.com. Very privacy invasive if you can read what people are Googling or uh, what they are sending in their emails. Windowsupdate.com, uh, which is like the, the back door to some of the uh, Windows uh, world. Uh, Mozilla.com, you could, uh, the attacker could manipulate the Firefox download, sign it with uh, the, the certificate uh, and ship it over a securely seeming website. Uh, Tor project and and so forth. So this was back in uh, 2011, and this was not just a small incident. It's what it just hasn't been a small CA, um, but it was a, a regular CA with uh, regular business. Um, what's more on this hack is that uh, these certificates have then been used to intercept communication of clients, people browsing the web, reading their email. Uh, and uh, the, the company which investigated the breach afterwards found out that uh, at least 300,000 uh, IP addresses were connecting to google.com uh, and were seeing this fraudulent certificate. 99% of them uh, which were from Iran. Uh, so it was kind of a nation state attack against uh, clients of either ISP based or uh, border gateway based, where people were browsing, um, were thinking they were browsing secured by HTTPS, um, but they were actually not. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, frame from the uh, video. So the, the guys from Fox IT, which investigated 
uh, this breach, uh, they use the OCSP request. So every time uh, you get a certificate, your browser has to somehow figure out whether or not this certificate is still valid. Uh, if it has been revoked, um, it would be nice to not use it anymore. And one of the approaches which uh, is used is so-called OCSP. So the client asks the um, certificate authority, hey, is this um, still valid? Uh, and this uh, have been locked. So each of these requests is uh, one of the clients seeing this uh, certificate, this fraudulent certificate, uh, and asking Diginotar, hey, is this certificate still valid? And as you can see, most of the connections, it's actually a movie, so you can see the, the lights flickering and popping up and down uh, as people go to sleep and wake up again, uh, and most of the people were uh, from Iran. So how did Diginota got hacked? They, they got really, really badly hacked uh, because they had vul vulnerabilities everywhere. They had a system running which was incomprehensibly insecure for a certification authority. So people think that if you run a certification authority, you build the foundation for uh, secure communication online. You are the one securing internet communication. Um, and if you run such an entity, people think you know security. Um, actually, um, <laughs> Actually, Diginotar did not. So they had unpatched software, which was facing the internet. Might happen. Um, they didn't have antivirus on the machines that issued these certificates. Um, they didn't have a strong password for their admin accounts. So like password or admin. Uh, actually, you can read the report online and the recommendations from ENISA, from the European security um, body. They listed all the things that have been found and uh, identified. Uh, also, all the certification uh, issuing servers were in one Windows domain. Um, and also, what, what uh, kind of bad uh, from Diginotar, they kept the incident secret. Of course, they did not uh, want it to spread out, to spew into the internet, hey, we got hacked and we have um, had bad security. Um, they kept this incident hidden for more than two months. And after two months, uh, when it got pu public and when they, uh, the, the internet found out that actually something really, really bad happened, um, they found out and uh, Diginotar then went bankrupt. That's a s sad ending of the story. Um, but this is not, not one of the the problems that uh, certification authorities face. So if you run a certification authority, you issue certificates based on the identity of your customers. So um, you can create sub root CAs, so you can say, hey, Martin, he looks like a nice guy, he looks like he knows security, let's make him a CA, make him uh, verify identities. Um, yeah, probably not a good idea, but um, the, the, this is what, what the business model of HTTPS and uh, certification authority is. They issue certificates uh, and they grant the permission to issue um, certificates as well. Uh, and the entire goal of, of these companies is to, to get into the trust stores. So every browser, every operating system, every uh, thing that connects over TLS has something like a called trust store, uh, where it stores the entities which are entitled to issue certificates. Um, and the problem is, those CAs are not strictly audited. They have their requirements that they have fulfilled. They have to show that they have some kind of security. Um, but afterwards, once they are certific certified and once they are in the trust stores, there is not such a strong um, incentive um, to audit them because they are already in trust stores and they had their audits uh, and so forth. Um, and this can lead to... to many problems. Another uh, CA trust wave in 2011, uh, it issued a sub-CA certificate, so anyone with a sub-CA certificate can issue any domain, uh, can issue a TLS certificate for any domain, uh, and they used it for traffic introspection. So they were selling, I don't know, to a company uh, which was building appliances which can break open the network connections for, I don't know, banks, companies, uh, or entire ISPs, so that they can look into the uh, the traffic of its users. 
Also, there was uh, Lenovo Superfish, wonderful idea. Um, Superfish was a local man in the middle CA, and the goal of the Superfish CA was to break open HTTPS traffic so that they can inject ads. So, <laughs> e even though you're using Gmail and you have this nice, slick interface without Obvious, uh, obvious ads, uh, Superfish would break open this connection, would be trusted by the browser, uh, and would have huge overlay ads with, um, yeah. Um, Lenovo stopped cooperating with Superfish. I think they made, this was pre-installed on uh, Lenovo notebooks, um, so they had a local CA installed on the uh, system, so they could inspect the traffic and show ads to users. Um, what's even more interesting is that all these CAs had the same key, and the private key was in RAM. So anybody could extract the, the private key of this CA, use it uh, to um, sign certificates for anything, uh, and have an additional layer of uh, HTTPS injection where you could not only show ads, but also read the emails or uh, do whatever uh, you want. Very bad. They're not doing it allegedly anymore. Uh, then there was in, uh, in China, the CNNIC, uh, they issued a sub CA for introspection companies. Again, company wanted to sell appliances where they could break open HTTPS connections uh, and look into the traffic of the users. Uh, and there was another incident just this year. Symantec was issuing s uh, test certificates um, to, to a company or uh, whatever. Uh, among them, Google.com, Opera.com, uh, so things you probably not would like to test, um, got caught. Uh, and the nice thing about this incident is they already had certificate transparency inst installed. And we will come back to this incident uh, in a minute. So. Traffic introspection is a valid thing. So if you, have, if you have a fleet of planes and they are connected via expensive satellite connections um, and you really pay a lot for bandwidth, you would like to block, for example, Netflix or anything which causes a lot of traffic. Um, one of the approaches which was taken by GoGo, they had a traffic introspection uh, device in their planes and they issued non, not trusted certificates to inspect the traffic. Um, bad for them, uh, Adrian Porterfeld, who works for Google, um, noticed this and uh, Google is not doing this anymore. Um, yeah, and even though, even though traffic introspection sounds like a really bad thing, I, I can think of uh, use cases where this is legit. If you run a company, if you run a bank, and you want to prevent people from leaking data, um, this can be uh, okay, but it has to be transparent. People have to know that this is happening, that they are inspecting everything, uh, and still won't prevent people from carrying out the USB thumb drive with uh, all the data on it. So, this is the, the big picture why we need certificate transparency. We would like to see uh, which certificates have been issued by a specific CA. Uh, some minor issues, not really minor, uh, that additionally come to play is that TLS has its uh, issues, um, nonetheless whether these certificates are issued or not. Uh, one of them is certificate revocation is tricky. So, um, it's not as easy as just saying this uh, this certificate is not valid anymore. Once a certificate is issued, uh, it is valid until the date uh, shown in the certificate, which can be three years. Um, so, happens to be if on the first day of using this certificate, people notice, ah, we should revoke it, um, clients that don't get this update will be able to use this certificate for two and more uh, years, so forth. Uh, also, another limitation is that all CAs uh, can issue certificates for all websites. So any of those 1,800 CAs and sub-CAs which uh, were in trust stores in 2013, they can all issue a certificate for google.com or facebook.com. This is not prevented by any means but social means and contracts uh, which states that they have to check the uh, legitimacy of the request. Uh, what this, this was published in a paper in 2013, so there are more than 1,800 CAs which can sign uh, certificates for 
any domain in regular user devices. Um, another paper in 2014 found out that one third of them, one third of those 1,800 certification authorities never issued a single HTTPS certificate. This makes you wonder, why are they then in the trust store and uh, so forth? Um, you can claim a certain percentage of them. They are used for issuing private certificates, so within networks or uh, whatever. Um, still, one third of them never issued a publicly uh, obtainable uh, HTTPS system, uh, certificate. Then, of course, there are the implementation issues. TLS has a long history of implementation flaws, not just cryptographic, there's Logjam, Freak, Poodle, whatever. Uh, they, they are a completely separate issue, but the implementation issues are troubling the um, device security on a constant pace. A uh, famous example is go-to-fail from iOS, where they had an additional go-to-fail missing bracket, uh, and the certificate validity wasn't checked. Also, uh, we have a lot of embedded devices. Once they are powered up, they used to, they used to generate their private key, uh, and they have no access to good entropy. Entropy on embedded devices is uh, surprisingly hard, so a lot of them generate the same keys. Uh, and as already mentioned, we have different trust stores per, uh, per browser, per operating system. Everyone has a different trust base. So, of course, every CA tries to get access into all of the trust stores, get shipped with system updates to be trusted, um, and uh, yeah, we have a diversity which is uh, not natural. It could be much easier uh, if people would have the same trust base on all their devices. And there are plenty of deployment issues. Um, SSL v2, everybody thinks it's that, but apparently it's not. Um, Sebastian Schinzel will give a splendid presentation uh, two hours from now about the drown attack. And the drown attack uh, uses SSL v2 weaknesses in email transport, simply because it's activated and it uses the same key. Uh, you can attack top-notch TLS 1.2 encryption because this is still here. Uh, there's the whole schmafu of the SHA-1 certificates, so um, certification authorities are not supposed to issue any SHA-1 certificates anymore. Some do, some get caught because they backdated their certificates and so forth. It's, it's a mess. Um, then there are cipher suits, so there are more than 500 cipher suits available uh, for the different version of uh, TLS. Um, every admin would like to be secure as possible, but which should he choose? Uh, as soon as there is money involved, like Amazon, or uh, they need to be compatible with uh, Internet Explorer 6, and, and so forth. It's, it's really a mess. Yes, and of course, uh, email, start TLS, um, email never had the design to incorporate security and authentication. So, as always, they just popped it on top and this is star TLS. Um, problem with star TLS is it can be suppressed um, and people will fall back to plain text if they cannot reach the service with star TLS. Perfect forward secrecy and so forth. Deployment is, is another topic uh, which can be a talk about. And there's this troublesome development that the CAs, they get bought and they get sold constantly. So just this year, Symantec bought the company BlueCode. Um, BlueCode, uh, so Symantec is one of, the, one of the larger CAs. They run the entire, not the entire, but they run large parts of the uh, certifications that are observable. Uh, BlueCode got popular in the Arab Spring because they found BlueCode proxies, which are capable of using man-in-the-middle attacks to conduct traffic introspection, uh, have been used at an ISP, I think in Syria or Egypt. They found them and they have been deployed nationwide. So if you think about it, that Symantec, the, one of the larger CAs, is buying a blue code, one of the larger traffic introspection companies, uh, things can look really fishy or scary. Of course, they promise they will never use the Symantec. So, yeah. <laughs> So this is the state we're in. This is fine. It's not, but people uh, still think about it that HTTPS is safe. And actually, it took 
it took a decade to teach people that they have to search for the lock icon. But if they do not understand, or actually they don't, do not need to know how the lock icon appears, but the entire lock icon is a farce if you uh, dig into the details and um, yeah, we're all sitting in a room uh, filled with flames, so to say. So this is where certification Certificate transparency comes into play. Certificate transparency has the goal to identify fraudulent certificate certification authorities. Um, in a perfect world, um, any certification authority would publish all its logs, uh, would publish all the certificates it issues. So as soon as I get a certificate for schmiedeke.net, um, the certification authority, this is public this is part of the public-private key. It can be public. Um, so uh, wouldn't it be nice if the CA would publish that it just issued a certificate for schmiedeka.net? Um, basically, yes. Uh, of course, certification authorities do not want this to happen, in particular if they're selling to uh, funky states or um, funky businesses which uh, earn their, mo their money with traffic introspection uh, and so forth. So. The perfect world would be the public key of each certificate would be published. The certification authority could say, hey, I just issued this certificate, uh, and everybody could see it, could verify it, uh, and uh, it would be, uh, well, a better world. Um, yeah, this would uh, help to detect problems very early. So if a small Dutch a certification authority would issue a certificate for, for google.com or torproject.com, this would be noticeable. I mean, this is a small CA. They would be really, uh, I don't know, they should be really surprised if google.com decides to issue a certificate uh, for their service. Um, this would shorten the window of opportunity for an attacker. Uh, also, uh, the idea is to have some form of punishment for misbehaving CAs. Uh, so at the moment, right now, if a certification authority uh, fucks up uh, and Google is affected, they mandate that uh, they need to have additional steps to be reintroduced uh, into the trust stores. Yeah, so this is what Google did. They did the Power Ranger move and they uh, decided they want to uh, make the yeah, make the internet more secure. Uh, why Google? Well, Google is uh, uniquely positioned in a way that they control the clients with the browsers, with the Android system, uh, and they also control a large portion of the, the uh, servers. So every, everyone uses Google, uh, except for those that use Bing. Um, and other, uh, no, <laughs> just kidding. Um, what, what Google did is, one, once the DigiNotar hack got public, they pinned their certificates. So since Chrome has a decent update cycle, they can ship the certificates, which they expect to see, with the browser update. So as soon as browser updates in the background, um, it can uh, enforce the specific certificate that it expects to see for google.com, youtube.com, uh, and whatever. Also, it has a really huge market share, 50% and more, depending on how you count. Uh, Chrome and Chromium are rather popular. And lastly, they are a common target. So if uh, some dictator decides to introspect uh, Client emails, user emails, uh, usually they target gmail.com because uh, they have a decent uh, security. They do not have any other vulnerabilities or backdoors to, to allow access to their, uh, to their uh, content, and uh, which makes the attack to Gmail a very drastic attack. And with the changes that Google introduced into Chrome uh, with the certificate pinning, they can now detect these attacks. But this was already back in um, 2011. Uh, since then, for example, the Port of Felt uh, tweet I show you, uh, if Chrome would uh, go to a website, google.com or youtube.com, uh, and would see a fraudulent certificate, they would um, warn the user. And what Google then did uh, was to, to propose a standard to make an RFC, uh, how to transparently publish the logs for certificates that have been issued. 
So the idea of the RFC is that every certificate issued is public. This is, um, this is uh, implemented in a public append-only log. So they have a log, they have open APIs, and they accept every certificate. Then, cryptographically assured, the client, like the browser, can verify that this is a publicly logged uh, certificate, um, and the entire system is open for all. So you can go to the website, you can get the source code, you can run your own, uh, own log for uh, RFC 6962, um, and everyone is happy. So, and the goals were to detect misbehaving CAs. Uh, as I said, they have their audits, they have their compliance regulations uh, and so forth, um, but not on the certificate level. With certificate transparency, they become uh, auditable by the public, by the browsers. Everyone can query the logs uh, and see whether or not this particular certification authority has issued a certificate for uh, google.com. All right, now, upon reading the RFC, uh, there are three entities which are part of certification transparency. Uh, there are, for one, the logs, uh, which are like giant uh, vacuum cleaners. They ingest all the certificates which are sent to them, uh, and then cryptographically sign them uh, and issue the assurance uh, that this specific certificate has been locked, and this has been issued and has not been tampered with, uh, and so forth. Then there are monitors, they identify suspicious certificates, usually these are the certification authorities themselves which run those monitors, uh, and then there are the auditors. The auditors uh, usually are implemented in the browser, and they verify that the, uh, that the issued certificates are really locked. And looking at them in, in detail, um, the, the role of the monitor and the auditor is kind of interchangeably, so monitor can be an auditor back and forth. Um, but what the monitor does is does it, it, it fetches all the certificates. So you have this giant pool of certificates, they are cryptographically assured, uh, which we will see soon. Um, and the monitor just fetches them all, and they have some form of uh, semantic checking. They can see, uh, has there been a certificate for my domain? Has there been uh, any sub-CA created which is able to uh, issue certificates for traffic introspection, uh, and so forth? Also, what they can then, uh, with this data, do is they can identify misbehaving log operators. Um, I said the logs, they are just gigantic uh, hoovers which collect all the certificates, uh, and they, are, they need auditing too, of course. They, need, uh, they have a position of power because they're managing this huge pool of certificates, um, and one needs to challenge the log uh, to identify misbehavior. And this can be done by the monitors, but can also be done by the auditors. So every client uh, right now it's implemented in Chrome. Chrome checks for these uh, certification uh, transparency uh, cryptographically signed blobs. And they, the browsers and everything, they can verify the log integrity as well. So in the back end, the, the log, it creates a hash tree. This hash tree is signed. Um, and uh, yeah. We will come to that in a second. Um, I got lost here. Yes, so both monitors and auditors, they query that the log entity is working correctly. Um, it wouldn't be a good thing if China could go to Google and say to them, hey, um, we would like to have this certificate removed. Um, Google could then comply or could not comply, um, but whether or they remove the certificate, this would be auditable and this would be observable to the public. So the good thing is anyone can run any software. Uh, any one of you in this room can run a log entity. You need to have some kind of uh, access to certificates, so whether or not you're a certification authority, or um, you can just run a public log and everybody can push their certificates to your uh, service. Uh, right now, it's, this is not the case. Usually the CAs run the 
uh, monitors and they run the logs. Um, but this is not by design. Anybody can run uh, anything. One of the problems is uh, availability. So even though I can set up a log for uh, certificates, uh, I have the problem that my log uh, needs to be online 24-7. And my ISP is not happy uh, if I ask him to guarantee this for me if I not, don't pay much, much, much more. So, how does it work? Um, currently, if you get a certificate, you go to the certif certification authority, you say, hey, I'm this wonderful domain, please could I get a certificate? Um, and then you get the certificate. Um, what's additionally happening with certification transparency is that the CA, upon issuing the certificate, uh, this can be any CA, this can be Let's Encrypt, this can be uh, Thoughty, Symantec, uh, you name it. Um, what they do is they send the certificate once they uh, issued it. Um, they send the certificate to one of the logs. Uh, the log then uh, sign the, the successful uh, rece reception of the certificate uh, and immediately send something back. This blob is called the uh, SCT, the signed certificate timestamp. Uh, and this can then be included in the certificate or uh, with other ways. Um, but key point here is that the, once the server installs this certificate, it also uh, installs this SCT so that browsers can see it and parse it. Yeah, some people I might have lost here. Uh, nonetheless, this is, <laughs> um, everything is easier in pictures. So right now, currently, and these are the pictures from the certification transparency website. Uh, thanks for making them. My tick skills are really not that good. So I would never have been able to make such beautiful graphs. So currently there's uh, the certification authority. It issues a certificate and the, the website then installs it in the correct uh, directory, um, the clients check it, and uh, encryption can happen. Um, the, the additional step, and this is the nice thing, uh, it can happen without any additional steps uh, on the server side and the client side, it's just that the certification authority needs to do an additional step. So in, instead of just issuing the certificate, they send the certificate to the logs. Uh, the logs immediately sends back the so-called SCT, the signed certificate timestamp, uh, and this is then included in the certificate which is shipped to the client. And then the client, if it supports it, can ask the uh, server whether or not this particular certificate is included or not. The things that come back from the log they are signed, they have an ID, and they have uh, a timestamp. These are the important things. They uh, need to be included in those uh, SCT. Um, also, what will be interesting in the future is that a certificate can have multiple log entries. So the, the SCT is uh, like a promise. The, the log operator promises to include this certificate uh, in its logs. Uh, and everybody can check afterwards then if this log has really publicly logged or if the authority has omitted to log it. Uh, in the future, it will be the case that many uh, SCTs can be within a certificate. So I can, if I am a certification authority, I can go to any log operator, send them every certificate I have, uh, and then include many, many uh, SCTs. And the SCT is not private. This is just an ID, it's a timestamp, uh, and it's a signature. Yeah, this is probably uh, too much. There are multiple ways for the uh, for the client to verify that this certificate has an SCT. So one of the methods, uh, for example, is OCSP stapling. Uh, right now, if you have a certificate, uh, instead of going to the CA, the server can staple the OCSP request signed by the CA. Uh, and uh, within this OCSP stapling, there can also be the SCT included. <clears throat> How does it work? 
on the log side, um, everything there is is a Merkle hash tree. A Merkle hash tree is a wonderful data structure. It's nothing new, it's nothing fancy, and it's not uh, the blockchain. Um, <laughs> the, the Merkle hash tree was it ha it, it looks, it's a binary tree, so every node has two uh, children, uh, and the hash value of an inner node depends on the two children. So usually it's the concatenation of the values of the two children uh, gets hashed again up to the root. Uh, makes it very space efficient because uh, if I want to verify the integrity of one entire tree, uh, all I have to check is the uh, hash value of the root. Um, then, I, of course, I can get all the uh, relevant uh, hash values and then I can reconstruct it. CT uses uh, SHA-256 uh, Merkle tree, uh, and as I said, everything below a certain node um, is responsible for the hash value. So if you remove a node, um, if you add a node, or if you relocate a node, uh, the hash values of all the upper nodes uh, get changed. Yeah. So each of the lock operators uh, additionally to the promise that it will include every certificate that it receives, uh, it also gives a promise on the maximum merge delay. So the SCT, this promise to include this certificate chain into the log, um, it can only finish immediately because it's a promise to include this uh, into the log. Uh, and the maximum merge delay is the time that the uh, log operator promises to include it in the big, big uh, Merkle hash tree. Yeah, the, the good thing about the Merkle hash tree is, despite being very space efficient, calculation efficient, um, not that much data overhead, uh, and so forth, uh, it's not possible to backdate elements. This was interesting for uh, one of the certification authority which issued SHA-1 signed certificates, even though uh, the browsers and everyone agreed that this should not happen anymore. It's also not possible to remove elements that have been once in there. So if Symantec decided to remove the google.com certificate, which was a test certificate, um, they, this would be noticeable as well, because if you remove one of the uh, leaves, uh, the hash values up to the root, they all change. Uh, and it's also not possible to add elements. So if you would like to add an element unnoticeably, you, you cannot do this because the hash values of all the upper nodes uh, would change. Yeah. So how do the, the logs operate? What, what they usually do is once every hour, they receive the certificates, um, and once every hour, they include them into the, their uh, Merkle hash tree. Um, probably already too much detail, but they build a separate tree and then include it uh, and recalculate uh, the root hash value, which is then signed and uh, shipped. And the, the nice thing about the Merkle tree is that you have multiple ways of proving things. So one of the, uh, one of the things that can be proved is that um, whether or not this, uh, this lock operator is honest. So if a lock operator removes one of the certificates, this becomes visible by changing all the relevant nodes. Yeah. Also, it's very efficient. Also, uh, figure from the project's website. Um, so on the left side, you have a, a Merkle tree with some added uh, certificates, some appended certificates. Uh, and if a monitor or an auditor decides to challenge the uh, log operator at a later point in time, uh, whether or not these certificates D6 and D7 have been correctly added, uh, all the log operator has to send uh, are those highlighted uh, nodes. This is the root, this is the thing that is signed, for example, every hour. Um, this is public. Um, the certificates, they are public because like, there are certificates. Um, and if now someone wants to verify that uh, not only these have been included, this is very easy because you just have to calculate all the way up, uh, but also verify that all the other certificates are still there. So none of the old certificates has been removed. Uh, there only needs to be three uh, hash values transmitted, um, and then the challenger can recalculate everything. So as soon as the challenger knows 
uh, those hash values, they can concatenate everything back together, uh, and in the end, it should have the same hash value as the root. Another proof that is possible is that whether a specific certificate is still in the log. So it's um, not only possible to challenge the consistency of the entire log uh, regarding old data, but it's also to verify that a specific uh, certificate is still in the logs or made it into the logs. Uh, remember, the SCT, the thing that finishes immediately, um, is just the promise to include it in the logs, uh, and at the later point in time, um, uh, the anyone, any auditor can uh, challenge the uh, log operator uh, if the certificate is really in the uh, log. So again, uh, if I want to verify that a specific certificate is in the uh, is in the log, I have the certificate that I would like uh, to to challenge. Uh, then I just need in this example those three nodes uh, and everything else. Uh, the J node can be calculated because I have the certificate, then I have the hash of the certificate, I need this hash, then I can calculate this value, uh, and so forth until I'm at the root. Yeah. So much for, for under the hood, Merkel hash tree are gone. Uh, one of the problems of those logs are they are ever growing. They, you might have noticed there is not a single word of deleting a certificate uh, for valid reasons. Uh, they are ever growing, and uh, of course, nothing is uh, nothing is forever. Uh, so, what log operators do is that they rotate the logs. So, at a specific point in time, the log gets frozen. The tree is tree is then static, uh, and uh, there is another log entity which is brought online and used for uh, including the newer certificates. Uh, quite recently, Aviator from Google got uh, frozen. Uh, it contains 46 million certificates. Uh, small drawback of freeing, freezing a log is that uh, as long as one certificate in this log, uh, in this tree, is still valid, uh, this log needs to be reachable. As soon as the, all the certificates in the log have been expired, it can be dumped, um, but until that, uh, it has to be uh, available for uh, the proofs. One of the issues um, is that right now there are just a few lock operators. Uh, in the future, there should be many more, not hundreds, thousands of them, uh, but maybe hundreds of them, uh, and they need to exchange information. So um, some form of uh, lock chatter should appear where the log operators chatter uh, with the clients to verify that they all see the same state uh, of the uh, Merkle trees. And this has been uh, published in a paper uh, last year. Right now, uh, the idea is not yet uh, at a level where they need to chatter, um, which we will soon uh, see. This happens when you create memes on the train. Uh, usually they're very bad memes, but this is apparently Gossip Girl. I've never seen it, but if you Google gossip and meme, ta-da! <laughs> so, uh, who now runs the log? Who are the entities which are actively running logs? Uh, of course, Google is running the majority of them. They proposed the entire thing, they wrote the code to, to run these things, um, and they run the large open for all uh, certificate logs. Three of them currently are open for all. Uh, another one is for Let's Encrypt certificates, and another one is for non Let's Encrypt certificates. Of course, Let's Encrypt issues a lot of certificates, thankfully, um, so they separated that, apparently. Uh, if you read the mailing list, they promise that these three open for all logs are uh, separated geographically and administratively, so they are run by different entities, but um, again, they all have the same boss and some way um, there would be, it would be better if there would be more open logs, so to say. Uh, Sumentech uh, has one, WoSign, CNN, IC. Uh, every time uh, Google detects that a, a fraudulent certificate for Google.com has been issued, uh, those certification authorities are mandated to uh, run CT. 
which is a good thing. I mean, public and everything. Um, also, from uh, Google has tens of millions of certificates in them. They are, really have an open for all lock, so everyone can push certificates in there. Uh, Digitzert, Symantec is kind of big, uh, but all the other nodes which are listed on the websites, they have 100,000 ish certificates, which is uh, not that much compared to 50 million or 60 million. Uh, right now, Google already mandates uh, certification transparency for extended validity uh, certificates. So if you not only see the green uh, text up in the uh, left corner of your browser, but also some fancy name and the big, big green whatever. Um, this is an EV cert, and Google maintains uh, for EV certs to have two SCTs. <coughs> Firefox is in the process of including it, I think. Um, yeah. Also, apparently, certificate transparency works because uh, when Symantec issued this certificate for Google.com, they released a report stating that they found 23 test, candidate, uh, test certificates. Um, Symantec said it issued 23 uh, test certificates, um, but the logs are public. Anybody can query them, and within seconds, you can see that uh, Symantec issued also another 164 uh, certificates for other domains and also uh, two and a half thousand certificates for non-existing domains, just regarding this one issue. So, uh, I need to hurry, time is running out. Uh, some of the downsides of certification transparency, uh, of course, uh, privacy. Um, people can learn your internal hosts. So if you have a NAS, for example, and this NAS is only reachable within your LAN, uh, and you wanna ha get rid of the browser warning whenever you access the interface of your NAS, uh, you can get a Let's Encrypt certificate. Um, but since not only the certificate is published, but also it's logged, um, people can see in the public log files that there is for your domain uh, a NAS. Uh, also, log entries must contain the entire chain up to a trusted root certificate, uh, which excludes everything which is self-signed uh, and everything uh, which is Dane. Uh, Dane is for uh, verifying TLS certificates using DNSSEC. Um, and since these two have no trusted root, uh, they are currently not working for certificate transparency. Now, of course, you want to see the data, you want to see, you want to play around with uh, this. Um, Basically, what you can uh, query, everything is JSON. So if you know JSON, you can work with certificate transparency. Um, the basic URL is uh, like this. The URL is any log server responds with the current root uh, and its signature uh, using this URL. Um, most interestingly, it gives you also the number of certificates uh, and the timestamp. Uh, it looks then like this, JSON, so you have, uh, this is the Aviator log from Google, which is now frozen, has 46 something million uh, certificates. Uh, the hash value of the Merkle tree uh, and the signature. Also, you can challenge the certification uh, logs with uh, consistency proofs where you have two states of their tree uh, and the log has to prove that it uh, did not modify anything in between them. Um, and uh, of course you can verify that specific certificate is in the uh, tree with uh, the second URL. And you can just push certificates there with a post request. So you push it, they send back the SCT. Uh, if you are the log operator, you would then include this. So. Any website right now which is not using SCT, all it takes is a post request. Nothing more. Um, yeah, some screens from the internals. So this is for google.com uh, in the uh, net internals view. Uh, what you can see is that uh, signed certificate time send, the SCT, uh, is received. Uh, it is uh, valid and uh, compliance is checked. Um, so this was for google.com uh, and everything worked out. Last but not least, just to mention it, Komodo operates a large search engine, crt.sh. Uh, there you can query the 
uh, public logs. <coughs> and uh, also Facebook uh, recently added a monitor for uh, certificates. So if you own a domain name and you use an entity which, uh, no, if you own a domain, uh, you can get updates if the certificate changes. So they also monitor the, the public logs. Uh, and as soon as, uh, for example, facebook.com uses a new certificate uh, that is locked in CT, um, you can get a notification for that. This is what it looks like. Uh, remember, Facebook also can send PGP encrypted mails, then nothing leaks to uh, anyone. Um, this screenshot was borrowed from Scott Helmer. So what's next? Uh, just few um, one month ago, uh, Google uh, announced that it will mandate uh, certificate transparency from October 2017 on. So if you run a website which is secured by uh, TLS, you might want to check uh, before that date whether or not your certification authority is using uh, certification transparency. Uh, I would expect to have more logs and more certificates included in the logs. Um, yeah, in the far future, um, basically the idea of uh, transparency in this Merkle tree is open for anything. You could put key management, software releases, uh, anything in there. Uh, the team at Google, they also built uh, a prototype for that it's called Trillion uh, and described in the paper verifiable um, data structure. Before we come to the end and block um, and <laughs> questions, um, there. <laughs> there is a distinction. Of course, you could solve this problem with blockchain as well, but a Merkle hash tree is much more efficient, much more uh, elegant, uh, anything. Uh, when I talked to the colleague on, on the train here, he said, yeah, of course, you could just push the log into the blockchain, but yeah, not the same thing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Martin, for a very interesting talk. We have a few more minutes left for Q&A. So if you have a question, please line up next to the microphones um, and ask your question. Reminder that a question has a question mark at the end. Uh, also, if you are exiting, please do so silently and from the front door, please. Exiting from the front door, thank you. Uh, I think we have a question over there. Hello? Irgendwas drücken? Ah, okay. Um, do you can recommend some um, libs or software where I can um, download um, and where, where I can um, accomplish the TLS handshake from, from the client side so I can get the SCT via TLS extension, via OCSP extension, via the inherited pre-certificate SCT? Um. Not by heart. Uh, I mean, if it's part of the TLS certificate, anything will go open SSL, whatever. It's just a field. Uh, same is for OCSP. So anything that does OCSP uh, will include it. It's just that clients that do not know the extension will just not, they will ignore it. Mm -hmm. But anything that does OCSP or uh, SSL handshake will, will work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A uh, question from this microphone. Hello, thank you very much for the nice talk. I wonder, do you know how much space is needed to store all the, lo all the logs currently? I had the same question, but unfortunately not, no. I can, um, no. But what they store is uh, the tree and they s store the entire chain, uh, excluding the root certificates. So probably like two, three, four certificates per uh, entry, which is like, I think, I think you can buy at a regular electronic market uh, a hard drive which is able to fit a lot of those entries. Yeah. Um, next question from that microphone. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, why do you need uh, two SCTs for extended validation? Because a single entity might cheat. So it's like a, 
even though it's, uh, you can detect it, uh, it's still a time frame left. And if you have two SCTs which are operated independently, the idea is that it's not that likely that they too will collaborate to make a certificate disappear. Thanks. Uh, that microphone, yes. I'm actually a bit surprised because Google has been pushing for making the uh, server hello uh, as small as possible. And of course, this is increasing the, increasing the server hello with, in this case, an SCT. And of course, they're also doing, well, they are also doing OCSC tabling. Mm -hmm. So that makes it even bigger. And this is like a SHA-256. So we're talking 256 bits there, plus another one you said that, you know, one is not enough. Actually, I've never seen any that has more than one S, uh, uh, SCT. Um, have you? Uh, no. Okay. No. <laughs> not yet. No, but I've, I've looked around, but not yet. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So there's that. It's it's actually increasing the size, yes. and I'm just wondering, you know, where is this going? Like, are we are we just going to eat the the, the 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 cost of having all these SCTs and OCSC tapling, or are we prepared to eat that cost? If you, I think the the cost is small compared to the gain you get by HTTP two. So if you pipe anything to one singular connection, I think it's not that of a cost anymore. Uh, but of course, this is a policy thing to to require a certain amount of SCTs uh, to prevent um, fraudulent CAs. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um. Is the idea that this will replace something like the SSL observatory, where browsers send in threats they see, and then uh, you nodded, so I'm going to assume yes. And then also, like, how does this work for people who can't have their certs be public, for people who are like issuing things for internal networks? If you can't have the certificate public, um, probably the, the better way right now is to, to have a certification authority which is not using CT. Um, in the future, it makes it much more expensive. So you have to operate your own CA. You can incorporate it in the trust stores. Uh, but of course, this is costly. You have to sign the certificate and everything. So, But if, like, for in October 2017, when Chrome rejects all certs that don't have uh, signed timestamps, like, what do I do? Use Edge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can disable it somehow, but it's blah. Uh, yeah. Uh, just a question. What about um, the decentralized um, SCT with a DHT or other system? Not blockchain, of course. Uh, it's possible to do that without uh, central authorities? Sorry, say again. <laughs> English is very bad, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. uh, I say it is possible to do that uh, without central authority like Google or uh, other SCT, but with a distributed uh, table uh, like THT technologies? Yes, yes, of course. And uh, exist there are an, uh, an existing implementation? For the centralized thing, yes. Not yeah. for the distributed thing. Okay. But I think it's just... just Add in a layer of DHT uh, on top of it. So I can, I am sure you can think of a browser uh, extension which uses the DHT to, to obtain the SCTs. But right now it's just purely centralized, but the source is open. Okay, thank you. Hey, so um, I was just curious how it works if you have a certificate which gets revoked in context of the tree, especially if the tree is frozen. So how does this work? How do you revoke a certificate with a tree, and then how, how does it work if it's frozen already? Good question. Um, so the, the goal of, of CT is not to, uh, to it, it's not about revocation. So whether the, the revocation path is taken regularly. So you ask OCSP, um, it, it's independent of the revocation thing. It's just publicly saying that uh, this certificate has been issued. Um, so removing a certificate from the tree, which has been removed, uh, which has been removed, uh, revoked, um, is not part of the specification. This is not uh, the use case. It's just logging the certificates which have been issued. But if you audit all the the logs and you mm -hmm. want to know if something like is going on, it shouldn't be going on. Wouldn't mm -hmm. you want to know whether the certificate has been revoked at some point? Like yes, but not in the not in the logs. The logs are just to prove that the CA has issued this certificate and to prove that the log has correctly logged it. Revocation is different. Usually OCSP stapling with the CA, but that's a different channel. Uh, channel. 
So this is not for, for certificate transparency. Thank you. Okay, that's all the time we have for Q&A. Uh, big round of applause again for Martin for a great talk. <laughs>